What an extraordinary privilege to be with you. If you'll take your copies of God's Word and turn with me to Titus 3. I want to jump right into this. I've got my assignment uh, from Rick and Mel. And uh, it's this particular text of Scripture and the relationship of regeneration and full-orbed, fully embraced sanctification in which a sinner set free is fully and completely dependent upon God's grace while fully and completely engaged in the discipline of grace, simply to quote uh, the Apostle Paul, as was read earlier from Titus, 3, uh, Titus 2, 11 through 14. Titus chapter 3, if you'll look with me here uh, in God's Word, we're going to look specifically at these opening verses uh, down to verse uh, 8. Remind them, obviously speaking of Titus's ministry to the believers and the churches in Crete where he had been sent. Remind them to be, now watch this list, of active witness and obedience that the gospel produces in a pagan world such as Crete. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. The construction there would simply be all kinds of people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Father, I am grateful to you for these moments to be together in this word. I'm grateful to you for that wonderful outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And I am sure, Father, uh, in a gathering like this, the, certainly um, most here know you, love you, serve you. You've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And have known that that glorious work of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone came with attendant blessings. You've given us a hunger for your word, and we confess it abates at time. You've given us a desire to love and serve Christ, knowing if we love him, we would keep his commandments because he first loved us. You have worked in our lives so that we desire that Christ would be exalted, even though from time to time the siren call of this world distracts and detours us but you who have begun a good work in us and will complete it have now given us a heart to work out this salvation you've given to us with fear and trembling, for this is worship, our lives. And oh God, we only work out because you work in according to your good and sovereign pleasure. Lord, we need clarity. 
The doctrines of the Word of God are beyond us, even in a pristine state, much less sinners saved by grace. Our frailties are overwhelming. The old man within us keeps rising up. So, Father, we many times do not say what we ought to concerning the gospel, do what we ought to in light of the gospel, because we get clouded about the gospel, yet we acknowledge it is foundational. So will you help us, like our forebears, seek that wonderful work of the Holy Spirit even in these moments? And if the frailties I have mentioned are true about those who have assembled, they are much more true about the one who preaches. Would you, by your grace and mercy, allow that wonderful, sovereign, supernatural work so that in these moments, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would rejoice in Christ alone, knowing and making known the gospel of grace, the power of God, the righteousness of God. I pray in the name of Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I've got some ground to cover, and I see I'm in a very sacred church. That does, and by the way, Ligon is in the balcony where he got in trouble as a kid, and he's in trouble now because I know actually what he's doing is either tweeting or working on the sermon he's going to preach for y'all tomorrow. I'm, I'm fully aware of that right now. All of you up there can report on him to me afterwards. But uh, I would uh, suggest to you that um, we've got to get to this, and um, there's just some things that are on my heart. And I want to ask you to please keep your Bibles open or your copies of God's Word uh, either open or booted up, whichever you do now, and uh, keep them there because I want to work through this text with you. It's not so much a sermon, although it is sermonic. But uh, I want to work through this text with you in light of this relationship of regeneration and sanctification. If I can build on just a, a few thoughts uh, from what um, Rick and Mike have said. Uh, this is something that's very much upon our heart, and I'm grateful for my brothers. Let me just say very briefly, as was said, the Gospel Reformation Network is no uh, political party, ecclesiastical or otherwise. It's just simply a collegiate, fraternal uh, company of... Uh, of teaching elders who love the Lord, love the gospel, and sense that the ever-present battle before the church of avoiding the traps of libertinism and legalism has not diminished at all. And in fact, we may be, we sense at least, that in this wonderful era where many of our number have appropriately captured the gospel of saving grace from the perhaps um, past decades of infiltration, mostly the errors around legalism, that perhaps our philosophy of how to correct this, and therefore our theology, because methods always ultimately affect message, and therefore our theology perhaps can actually set up problems for our children in this church in the future. In other words, I simply think this. If you, if you deal with the issues of legalism that perhaps would come out of the inappropriate dynamics of some aspects of fundamentalism, I want to be careful with my language here, because I've got many of my brothers in that camp I love dearly, <clears throat> but, um, but as we deal with that, and I know I came out of it, and I cannot tell you how glorious it was when the gospel of saving grace uh, took hold of me, and I understand, I, can't, I'm, I remember getting converted and knowing I was saved, and then about six months later, reading the, reading the chapter on justification by John Murray, and it's like I got saved all over again right there. I mean, it was just absolutely glorious. But I also am grateful that I came under the mentorship of a lot of men in the PCA and a couple of Reformed Baptist brethren who let me know that this glorious work of salvation by grace alone brought a grace that was never alone. And that while my works did not save me, nor merit my salvation, nor maintain the, God's ability to save me, they would infallibly be evident to some degree that if there's a true root of grace, there will be true fruit that shows grace. And you are not... You are not called to stay apart from that activity. On the contrary, that you are to engage in promoting what you are depending upon God to do in your life. 
And I was so grateful to have heard those things. But I sensed that what is happening is, is, is perhaps not even thoughtfully, is if we press the edge in antinomianism or libertinism. I almost just wanted to bring an article that was in uh, the Aquila Report recently uh, that I read uh, that was just wonderfully stated, uh, our mild antinomianism, where we, and this relates very much to what I'm preaching tonight, where one of the reasons that perhaps we don't deal with the issue of pursuing victories, I'm not talking about an aberrant victorious life movement, but victories over sin in this life is because many of us don't understand that actually the work of salvation does empower you to say no to sin. And you can have victories before you get to eternity over sin in this life. And because of this, sometimes there's this um, defeatism concerning the Christian life and the pursuit of sanctification. And sometimes, <clears throat> therefore, as it moves forward, that, um, that the way to do this is we push the edge of, look what I can say and do in my liberties in Christ, saved by grace, and not only affect negatively our witness many times, but also pushing the edge there, not realizing what's going to happen. Can I go and tell you, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But any time the church goes into legalism in its concern for holiness, it'll produce another generation of antinomianism in the next generation. And if we pursue our attempt to capture grace by promoting antinomianism or libertinism. I like Calvin's uh, language better than ours, actually. If we pursue that, then, in fact, my children are going to grow up in a legalistic church. That's what's going to happen. Now, I'll probably be with the Lord before you get a chance to stone me if that prophecy doesn't come true. But that's my guess. Because that's, that's what church history constantly shows, time and time again. I love it when Jack Miller used to tell us, preach the gospel to the lost, to yourself, and to one another. What I don't like is now the gospel has been truncated to either justification or adoption. And we've become myopic. I much prefer another professor that I inherited at Westminster, John Murray. You've got to use shorthand for the gospel. Don't use any of the elements of the... And I'm using some language because I know I've got elders and, and, and even better theologians than you. Your wives are here tonight. So I know I can take some shortcuts. I wouldn't in my own pulpit. And that's, and that's this. Whenever we take any one aspect of the order salutis and make that the gospel out of our own personal needs and where we're coming from, what we've done is truncated the gospel. Murray said, if you've got to use shorthand, go to Romans 6. It's union with Christ. And what the order salutis does is tell you how God gets a sinner from the death trap of sin into life in Christ when he calls him and regenerates him and justifies him and adopts him and then puts him on the path of sanctification until he completes the work in glorification. And that whole dynamic needs to be present to explain what it means to be in Christ and Christ in you. So I don't want a myopic gospel. I don't want a reactionary gospel. And I long that the next generation of preachers that are much more gifted than me that are in the PCA, I long they embrace the whole counsel of God knowing that the gospel of saving grace is the first of the first things. Paul said, I deliver to you what is of first importance, the gospel. If we get it wrong, we get everything else wrong. And so it's absolutely crucial that this next generation grab that full-orbed gospel and they don't capture attention by pushing the edge of libertinism. Nor do they react with legalism, but they proclaim that whole counsel of God. And, and let me just say, when you preach God's word and you preach the theological truth, it just doesn't fit on a bumper sticker. You've got to drop shoes on both sides continually. Nor would we have a generation who has to do therapy on themselves in the pulpit 
and it spills over to the pew. Because we think, well, I was a legalist, so that means everybody else, that has to be their problem too. No, there's a reason Jude and 1 John and Hebrews and, uh, and 2 Peter are in there warning against antinomianism and libertinism. There's a reason it's there. There's a reason Paul carefully, continually uh, constructed his epistles so that he would put the gospel, you know the language, the gospel indicatives, then the gospel imperatives. And he didn't leave off the imperatives because he wanted to make sure you got the indicatives, but he always got the indicatives in place and said, now that you know who you are, this is why he saved you, to, this is what he's called you to do. There's a reason he did that. There's a reason when he gets to that marvelous, I just prayed it, there's a reason when he gets to that marvelous Philippians 2 text where he says, work out yourself, not for salvation, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's worship life is what you're doing. That's worship language. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God who is at work in you. It's what he works in that I then work out. And because I am dependent upon what he works in, then I'm called to work out with, with devotion and discipline and sacredness as an act of worship what he's put into me. But none of that ever fall, none of that is ever declared in Philippians 2 until he gets the real foundation in present in Philippians 1 6. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so with Christ as my foundation, now I can work out what this Christ is working into my life. Well, those are just some burdens that I have on this. I don't want a truncated gospel where it's just justification, just sonship, or just sanctification that eventually would lead to legalism. I don't want a, uh, a, a reactionary preaching of the gospel, a therapeutic where the preacher's working on himself and his past problems and assumes that about everybody else, that that's where they are. I, I ask the Lord, please work in my life. Bring these brothers to sharpen me so that I might preach that most foundational truth of all. I am not ashamed of, note the definite article, it's not a gospel, it's not any gospel, it's not, it's not some party's gospel in a church. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I didn't pay much attention in English grammar, but I, and that's pretty obvious, but I didn't pay much attention in English grammar, but I do know this, the definite article is a definite article, that means whatever it is modifying can be defined. There's something called the gospel. And then Paul says, just in case you need to get started on this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the, hello? At, Bar at Briarwood, we kind of talk back and forth. So uh, it, it is what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, Right? And so he brings before us what we sing. Lord, be of sin the double cure. Brothers and sisters, we're born into this world like the prisoner that goes to death row. And he's got a death sentence. In one year, we're going to put you to death. He's got a legal problem and a death sentence that's put on him. And then he gets sick his first week. Doctor comes in and says, sorry, um, you've got stomach cancer. You're going to be dead in six months. He says, oh, no. I'm going to be dead in six months. Well, I'm going to be dead in a year anyway. Until the governor comes in and said, here, here's your pardon. You're free. I have absolved your guilt for the death penalty. He says, You're, you mean legally I'm free? I'm not condemned anymore? I can, I can walk free? Yes. And he gets so excited because his legal problem's been dealt with. And he gets ready to leave the cell. And while he's getting ready to leave, he remembers, well, what good is this? I'm going to be dead from cancer in six months. Or you can turn it around. The doctor comes and he gives him a pill that'll cure his cancer. And then he realizes, I'm going to be put to death. We got a legal problem, we got a personal problem, and the gospel answers both of them. It provides not a righteousness, but the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So that our sins are removed and we're clothed with his righteousness. 
And he provides the power of God, and it's seen in two places directly. First, regeneration, when we've been brought from death into life. And then sanctification, when we really start living for Christ who gave us life. So if you'll look at this text with me just a little bit, I'm going to walk you through it real quick. This is kind of one of those, can I encourage you to do a series on regeneration? And if you did, you might want to go the route of a topical expository series. So if you did, then a topical expository series, I would encourage you, if you want to start teaching on regeneration, start with the New Covenant prophecy in Ezekiel 36, and then go to the illustration in Ezekiel 37 of dead bones coming to life. And then I'd encourage you to move, obviously, to our Lord's teaching in John chapter 3 when he says, listen, you've got to be born again before you can see or enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be born of the water and of the spirit before you can see or enter the kingdom of God. And then you can move right on to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 where he says, you're not only born of the spirit, you're born of the word that the living and abiding word of God has given you life. And then I strongly encourage you to go to 1 John and count the eight times of what he says those who are born of God don't do or do where he speaks pronounced, if you're born of God, you don't make a practice of sinning. You love Christ. You love righteousness. Go look at the way that he lays out the evidences of the new birth in 1 John. So I strongly commend that to you. But my assigned text was this one. Now let me tell you what's happened that y'all don't know. Titus was sent by the Apostle Paul to Briarwood Presbyterian Church to attend the Embers to a Flame Church Revitalization Conference in January uh, that's held then. Sorry, just a little plug. Uh, And then he sends him on a ministry of church revitalization. You know, we call call Timothy, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles. I'd like to suggest to you that really only one of them I would call a pastoral epistle, that's 2 Timothy, where he's putting the pastoral mantle on him. 1 Timothy and Titus, you ever notice how they've got so much of the same material in each of them? That's because he was sending these two men to do the same ministry. Timothy was going to Ephesus on a ministry of church revitalization. And he was sending Crete, he was sending Titus to Crete to set in order what remains a ministry of church revitalization. And then he lays out the first things of revitalizing, bringing the church back to health and vitality. Then he gets to the benedictory chapter with Titus in chapter 3. And he says, now Titus, this is what I want you to do. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, I want you to remind them. I want you to remind them as believers. Now God's blessed your ministry. There's health, there's gospel health and vitality in this church. Now here's what your ministry ought to be produced. Remind the believers and he lays out for them their life of submission to rulers and authorities. That's not natural for us. We'd much rather critique or find cable programs that critique for us. We'd much rather critique those and um, and not pray for them, not honor them, but to critique. Now, I'm I'm not opposed to critiquing public policy, but what do we do with those who are in authority over us and rulers? He said, here's what a believer does, and to be obedient. And by the way, be ready for every good work. And by the way, not only that, don't speak evil of people. And by that way, another thing, avoid quarreling. Certainly there's a place for disagreement and discussion, but not this mindless quarreling. Be gentle. Show courtesy to all kinds of people. And then he says, now I want you to live that way because there was a time none of us lived that way. And you hear Paul's language where he does not think that when someone is saved that they are doomed to be the victims of indwelling sin the rest of their life. They got to do battle with it but they're no longer under its dominion. Look at his language. This is what he says. Call them to be that, for we ourselves were once foolish. But something's happened. We were. We couldn't live that way that I've just said that we ought to be living. Here's the way we used to live, and has there ever been a a better, it's not an exhaustive, but a better portrait of depravity? where he says, here's what we were. We were 
we were foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, hating one another. And then after he reminds, he says, Titus, remind them of now that they've come to Christ and are being equipped in this church in Crete, I want you to remind them how we live for Christ. And as you're reminded them, always remember that there was a time that we did not live that way. This is what we once were. But now, by God's grace, we can live this way. That's how we can live. Now, how is it that we get from what we used to be to what, by God's grace, we can be with our eyes fixed on Jesus? How did that happen? And so he explains it. Starts off with the two greatest words in the Bible. And um, I believe this with all my heart. But God. I love it every time it comes up. The wages of sin is death. But. I'm so glad there's not a period there. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God being rich in mercy. Well, here he is again. But, now notice what he says. Those two words, but God, but he adds two more words. Here's the pivot point in the text. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, what? He, say, there's your pivot. But God saved us. That's the pivot. Here's what, notice he doesn't say, he doesn't say, here's what we once were, but we got a little coaching from the Lord. Uh, we found a good counselor. We found out that that would be unproductive or if my business wouldn't succeed if I continued that way of life. No, God did an intervening, supernatural, sovereign, saving, life-changing work. God saved us. You didn't save yourself. You didn't help God save you. God saved you. But God saved us. And just in case we missed it, Paul has a good way of repeating things. But God, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs to the hope of eternal life. God saved us. Now, I want to answer very quickly, I want to answer some questions here from this text. This text here, this text says God did two things to change you. One, he justified you by his grace. Do you see that? Two, he regenerated you. The washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Those are the two things he did. Power of God, righteousness of God. Those are the two things that God did for you. He intervened into your life. He saved you. You were dead in your sins, and by, his, by the washing of regeneration, you came alive and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And now, that enabled you by faith to lay hold of Christ, and he justified you by his grace. Those are the two things he did. Tomorrow, my brothers will work out the issues of justification before you. My assignment, I leave that to them. My assignment is this matter of regeneration. I want to make a statement to you that's really hit me. And I, let me thank my first, second, and third John, who always accompanied me, John Flavel, John Brown, and John Owen, for the, uh, uh, for the insights onto this, into this text. Regenerate. If I talk about the biblical doctrine of regeneration, and I say... When you, want to, when you want to know about the biblical doctrine of regeneration, what passage would you go to? What passage would you go to? Just don't worry. You got a shot at it. You probably are going to be right. What would you go to? John 3. Absolutely. Or maybe Titus 3. You'd go to that. I would suggest to you you're starting at the wrong place. I believe the biblical doctrine of regeneration, palingenesis in the original, that word is only used two times in your Bible. God's 
work of regeneration, that word is used two times. To understand its use here, you need to understand its use in the first place. Take your Bibles and go back with me to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Unfortunately, every translator, it almost made it past the Geneva Bible. Every translator, I think, does us a little bit of a disservice because they go to interpretation more than translation, and I think they obscure this. So I want to get, share it with you. Matthew uh, chapter uh, 19. And you're well aware of the rich young ruler. And Jesus tells him, you've got to jettison all of the things that would hold on to you. And it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible. You cannot save yourself. So he blows up legalism, works salvation. You cannot save yourself. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, rich young man, you told him to live. Listen, we've left all to follow you. Now watch what Jesus says to him. See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, Palin Genesis, the correct translation, I believe, should be, in the regeneration. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what is God doing in regeneration? Get the large, big view. This creation, God is bringing forth into a new creation. He is bringing forth the regeneration where he rules and we will rule over it with him. How do we get there? Now come to personal regeneration. In other words, God's got this glorious plan called the regeneration. How, what does that look like? Well, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to two texts very quickly. Go with me to um, 2 Peter chapter 3. Two texts. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> where Paul answers the question, why is the Lord slow about his coming and the second coming? And uh, look, notice, just for the sake of time, go down to verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So with the Lord, a thousand years is one day and a, 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 is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should repent. If you work your way back, what he's talking to are the elect of God. The elect of God, Jesus won't come back until all of his have been gathered to himself. That's why he had, he's not slow, he's right on time. When the last, I mean, every once in a while when I have, by God's grace, and I'm sharing the gospel and, and I get the chance to pray with somebody and, I, you know, and then I share with them, if you've made a commitment to Christ from your heart, then here's what Jesus says to you. Truly, truly, he who believes in me has eternal life. Now, I have to confess to you that periodically my thought process is this. That may be the last one. Because in my eschatology, there's only two things got to happen before Jesus comes back. The gospel to all the nations and all of the elect to be brought in. That's it. So I always think that may be the last one. And when they've all been gathered in, then he comes. 
And when he comes, what will happen when he comes? But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for the regeneration, the new heavens, and a new earth in which righteousness will reign. In other words, what he's saying is this. When Christ comes back, all of this is going to be dissolved and burned up, and then he's going to unfurl a new heavens and a new earth. One other text. Go with me to Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What's going to be revealed to us? The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, what is he saying? He's saying you are in a creation and it is groaning. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, he says, what are the signs? He said, it's like birth pains. This creation is groaning to give birth to the new creation. Why? It's not because everybody got together and said, oh, let's have divorces, let's have tsunamis, let's have volcanoes, let's have hurricanes, let's have all this. No, this was, it wasn't subjected willingly. No, God subjected it. And as you're seeing the brokenness of this world, God's reminding you as, it, as these brokenness is here and you see the groaning of this creation, he's reminding you that sin has a consequence. He is reminding us with that parable every single day when we pick up the paper with tornadoes and hurricanes and massacres and all of those things. See what sin does. And it's a creation that's groaning. When I visit my people, or I've got one for you, prostate cancer. There's one I'm acquainted with now. That's groaning. And there's... Mr. Piper says from this text, rightly, if you realize that, that keeps you on a pastoral visit from saying something stupid, which if you had more faith, you'd get up out of this bed. The reality is we're groaning to be delivered. Not only the creation, we are. These bodies are groaning. It's groaning and we see it. You see, the, it, do not buy a book that says, see the number of hurricanes, the number of wars, and the rumors of wars. That means Jesus is coming. That is not it. The sign of his coming is the gospel to the nations and the preaching of the gospel to gather his people. The, those are birth pains. And like birth pains, they're increasing all the more as the day. It's the groaning of the creation to be delivered into the regeneration. Now, who's going to be there? Who's going to fill that? Well, the regeneration will be filled by those who he has regenerated personally. That's where he's bringing the heirs of this from. Now, if you would go back to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. What is this regeneration? How does it occur? How does this regeneration occur in our life? Well, so here's, let me just answer some questions. When are we regenerated? 
When are we saved? We are saved, and we don't have to worry about this. The text tells you. The clues are right there, aren't they? We are saved when the kindness of God appears. And here's a phrase. Oh, boy, this is a great study for you. Go to Titus and see how Paul uses this phrase, Jesus, our God, our Savior. Notice what he says. He says that, he says that we were saved. I'm sorry. Titus chapter 3. But um, he says, we, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So when does that happen? When the grace of God appeared, when God our Savior appears, that's when it happens. Of course, there were pictures of it, moments of it in the Old Testament. God's common grace, God's acts of power, the prophecies, the pro promises, the types, the symbols, and all of that. But when Jesus Christ came, his incarnation, his life, his atoning death, his resurrection, the grace of God has appeared in Jesus Christ. And because of that Christ, we are saved. It is the gospel of Christ and his saving work. So that gospel work has come into our life. And he says, now, why did God save you at the cross through Jesus Christ? And now the apostle Paul goes to something that we have to do with our preaching every time. Before he says why, he tells you what wasn't the reason. That's what he does first. It's called knowledge by negation. Here's what he says. Look at what he says. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, according to his kindness, according to his philanthropia, God's love for sinners, sinful man. That's why he saved. But before he says that, he says, not because of your works. Why? Because you, me, everybody in your pew, we have an automatic default program where no matter, even as saved, when God's grace comes into our life and God's bless us, we believe somewhere we had a part in this. Uh, we were the reason. So he says, not by your works done in righteousness, which, by the way, are filthy rags anyway. But not by works done in righteousness. God did not save you because you wanted it or you earned it. Isn't it glorious? I needed the Lord but didn't want him. And the Lord wanted me, but he didn't need me. And he saved me out of his philanthropia, out of his loving kindness, out of his mercy. And what did God have to do to accomplish that? His son came into this world and paid a debt he didn't know for me. I had a debt I couldn't pay. And then that ascended victorious son sent the Holy Spirit to take me from the tomb of sin to the triumph of life in Christ through the washing of regeneration. It's no accident that Paul's picking up on Jesus' language. The washing and renewal, the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Just go back to what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born of the what? The water and the Spirit. So with all due respect to the three-fourths of the commentators, I do not believe, I wish I had more time to talk, I don't, but I do not believe that speaking of baptism, which symbolizes the blessings of the gospel, but it's not talking. Why would he say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, just, you know what you need? You need to be baptized. He probably had been baptized seven times that day. Why would he tell a Pharisee another external washing would do it? The external washing never gets to the heart. But there is an internal washing that will fly into all of the areas of life. It is the washing of the word of God. Ezekiel 36. Sprinkle clean with the water. Declares it. And then exemplified in Ezekiel 37. See those dead bones? What do you want me to do? Can those bones live? Lord, you know. 
It doesn't look like it to me, but you know. Then preach the word. And the Spirit of God blew upon them, and bone came upon bone, and flesh upon flesh. In other words, what happened? They were raised up by the Word and the Spirit, just like you were. You were born of the Word and born of the Spirit. As God washed you from the inside out and renewed you by the Holy Spirit within your heart and in your life. That's what He did within you. Why? Not because of your works of righteousness, but because of his grace. See the four words? Grace, mercy, loving kindness, God's love for you because of what he has done for you. He saved you. Well, who did it? God did it. Pastor, Harry, why did God do it? God did it for this reason. Now, there's a lot of reasons why God regenerated you. I think it's multifaceted. God regenerated you so that instead of being dead, you could come to life. And now you, remember what he told Nicodemus? Unless you're born again, you cannot what? See or enter the kingdom of God. Why did God regenerate you personally? Well, he regenerated you to bring you to life to put you in the regeneration. There's one reason. Can I give you another reason? He regenerated you so that now you could, with the eyes of faith, see the Savior and the kingdom. And he regenerated you so that with the legs of repentance, that's the Siamese twin of saving faith, you could enter the kingdom. Why did he save you? For the praise of the glory of his grace. There's reason after reason that he saved you. In the supremacy of the glory of his grace that overarches all of it. But Paul makes sure we hear one reason that you might know he regenerated you. Go with me, if you would, back to Titus 3. Here's where we'll finish. Through the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Regeneration, power of God, justification, righteousness of God. The saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on this. This is the heart of the gospel. I want you to insist on these things. Why? So that those who have believed in God, regenerated, justified, those who have believed in God, notice his language, may be careful. May be careful to devote themselves to good works. Is it any different than Ephesians 2? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy, caused you to be born again to a living hope. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you see what Paul just did in, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? He just took, he took a stick of dynamite and he put it under the dam of legalism and he blew it up so the river of life could flow. But I always tell people after verse 9, please write in your Bible, keep reading. <laughs> For we are his poema. We're his masterpiece. Written in the blood of Christ is this masterpiece. For we are his poema, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works that we should walk in them. And so this same God who has made us who we are in Christ has now called us to what we are to be for Christ. And the language is not, you know, if you kind of feel like this, or if you... Uh, the language is that in light of regeneration and justification. See, ju isn't it wonderful? Isn't justification is wonderful. There is therefore now not, I'm not condemned and I'm innocent. See, I just heard the key in the cell block and it's unlocked and I'm not under that death penalty anymore. 
I've been set free and no condemnation. That means I don't have to play religion and cover up my sins. I can be honest and confess my sins because he is just and faithful. He doesn't go and say, hey, God, uh, Jesus doesn't go to God and say, you know, Harry's back confessing again, so can we give him a chance because, I, you know, I did that 70 times 7 thing. Can we just help him out a little bit here? He doesn't do that. He goes and he says, you know, Father, there's Harry on Highway 280 in Birmingham again. He's thinking the same thing. He almost said the same thing, and he was considering a gesture. But he has repented. You know, he's really trying. Let's give him a chance. No, this is what he says. Father, this is my son, your son. This is my redeemed. Forgive him of those sins. I paid for them. So I don't have to cover up my sins like Adam did in the garden. I can confess them and agree with God. I don't have to make myself look good to God. I can now rest in the righteousness of Christ. But I don't have to sin. This is where it's tough. That's why you got to preach faithfully. Don't go to bumper sticker preaching. Because your people are going to sin to the day they go to be with Jesus Christ. But you need to tell them they don't have to. Sin's dominion has been broken. Sin's been defeated. So if I can use the language that God is going to bring forth the regeneration in a new creation, it's the same language that Paul uses to the Corinthians. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, it's a little controversial here. You, got a new, you don't have two hearts you got a new heart, that old heart. I love what Vince Havner said about this. No, I'm sorry, wrong Baptist preacher. J. Vernon McGee. I remember what he said about it one time. I'm writing to do a, I'm writing to do a Bible study at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I used to love to listen to him on WMCU, and he would always come up with something, and he would just, and this time he said something that I actually pulled off the side of the road on Old Cutler and said, can he get out of this possibly? He said this, I am sick and tired of hearing preachers tell you to give your heart to Jesus. He said, where in the Bible does it tell you to give your heart to Jesus? That's a good tonight before you go to bed. Go find it. He said, what does Jesus want with your filthy old heart? He said, I want you to come to Jesus Christ. Because he doesn't just take your heart. He kills it. And he cuts it out. And he gives you a new heart. That he has written his law. Not because the law saves you. But because it directs you how to love your Savior who first loved you. You got a new heart. Okay, here's my controversy. I don't think you got two natures. Okay, don't bring charges. I don't think you got two natures. I think you're a new creation. I think you got a new nature. I think you got an old man. I think you got an old default system that you got to kill every single day and it clings to you like a corpse onto you so that every time something happens that God blesses you, you kind of think, well, I had my quiet time this morning. That was it. No, the reality is, is that all of God's blessings have been purchased for us and richly poured out from Christ, from the cross, and it comes upon us not because of what we've done, but because of his loving kindness. And one of those blessings is the Holy Spirit who has given us a new heart, who has given us a new nature, so I can die daily to sin. And then when I sin, I can confess, and he is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And yes, it can be said by the gospel, our people can say, I was this. Do not be deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice, not doesn't say your righteousness earns you the kingdom. It says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. Why? Because those who inherit the kingdom something happens for them and to them. Neither sexually immoral, effeminate, homosexual, swindler, drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. 
there's a list that's there of nine statements of unrighteousness. Eight of them were profoundly true about me. And all eight of them, to this day, 40 years later, in my new life in Christ, I got to go back and handle in the old man and address time and time again. But I know by God's grace I am not the victim of sin in this world. The power of God is within me. And I can not only confess, I can turn from my sin. Well, I thank you for your patience. I just want simply to plead for this. When people get intentional about their sanctification, let's no longer from pulpits accuse them of legalism. When they hate sin and want to kill sin, that's why they were saved, was to kill sin. Before they came to Christ, they fell short of the glory of God. All of my life was there to assassinate God's glory. Now that I'm converted, the glory of God rests upon me. And no longer in my heart do I want to assassinate God's glory. I want to exalt God's glory. And I falter and fail and I can confess. But by God's grace, there is progress. There is progress that God is growing us, not for grace, but in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And I can study, I can memorize, I can meditate, I can pray. And yes, small group accountability is not legalism. That's just Hebrews 10. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so instead of making fun of people, or ridiculing, or casting notions of, you know, when I used to do that, I was a legalist. Well, that was your issue. But the means of grace embraced intentionally to kill sin and follow Christ is not legalism. Sin's dominion has been broken. By God's grace, we've been born again. So in calling, it's Jesus plus nothing. In regeneration, God saves me. It's God plus nothing. In justification, it's the Lord plus nothing. In my adoption, I didn't call myself. I didn't regenerate myself. I didn't justify myself. God justified me. And I didn't adopt myself. Glorification, it's the Lord alone. In sanctification, God plus nothing is nothing. It's 100% God and 100% engagement. It's not 50-50. It's 100% dependence upon him. The language I learned it under was everything in the order salutis is monergistic until sanctification, which is fully synergistic. You work out, not 50%, 100%, all of your heart and your life. Because it's God who works in, not 50%, but 100%. And by God's grace, we might see this pursuit of holiness that would declare to a world, not only were we in our prison, and we heard the cell door unlock, but by God's grace, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forward to follow thee. All to Jesus. I, sur I don't know all the implications of it yet. I have no idea the implications of my surrender. But I know when the implications come, his strength will be sufficient that day. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Because he set me free to follow him. All the way to glory. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together in your word. Thank you for the glorious truth of your word that we might pursue holiness because you pursued us, called us, regenerated us, that we might come to Christ, justified us, adopted us, 
You've given us a new perspective. You've given us a new heart. You've given us a new record. You've given us a new family, sons of God. You've given us a new home. And those whom you've justified, you'll glorify. And on the way, you've given us a new life that is lived by the power of the Son of God in us. So that we might say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the power of the Son of God who loves me and who has saved me. I pray in his name. Amen.